welcome to another edition of Iowa's Agenda, cable television's public affairs program about the Iowa General Assembly. That's our legislature. The decisions to be made at the General Assembly and the people who make those decisions. Hi, I'm Tom Graves. Thank you for being with us again today. Today we have two prominent members of the Iowa Senate, and we're going to begin a discussion on gaming, we call that, up in the session. Most people call it gambling. And we're going to talk about what we should do in Iowa with gaming. Uh, first, we have the pro President Pro Tem of the Senate, Senator Jeff Danielson, a firefighter from Cedar Falls, Iowa, a Democrat. Thank you very much for being here, Senator. It's good to be with you, Tom. And Senator Danielson is in his second term in the state Senate. And Senator Randy Feenstra, a banker from Hull, Iowa, uh, in his first term in the Senate, a member of the Commerce, Education, and the ranking member of the State Government Committee, and also a member of the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, Senator Feenstra. Thanks for letting me be here today, Tom. And just to start with something other than gaming, which we're going to get to, just about the politics. So this session is different from any session I've been in before, with divided government, and it seems to me one house pursuing a completely different course than the other mm. in legislation. Uh, last year, last week, we had a, a contentious labor debate in the Iowa House uh, that that actually closed down debate and voted on amendments. But a bill that took them three days, which isn't going to come up in the Senate, right? Uh, that's right. So, is are we getting anywhere in this session? Yeah, I think it's helpful for Iowans to know that uh, at divided we govern, but united we stand. Uh, there are many issues that don't work themselves out in the governing cycle, which is what we're doing right now in the legislative session. Those are conversations that are generally solved on the campaign trail. We want to focus on the things that we can agree on, move those policies forward, and let Iowans weigh in uh, along the way. But those of us that have been involved in, in working on policies know that's, that's a part of the conversation. Sometimes you're going to disagree. We want to make sure we do that in a way that uh, people learn from the conversation. Well, Senator Feenstra, as a minority member of the Senate, has it seemed clear to you that, that like Senator Danielson, that you're just making progress? Yeah, I agree. I think we, we want to be collaborative and we want to work together. And, and sometimes we see it that, that one chamber is doing one thing and the other chamber is doing the other. And we never get together and actually work together and, and, and find, you know, create a final policy on, on these bills. So I'm hoping in the next several weeks that some of that can happen, that we just don't have two chambers doing different things and at the end of the day we get nothing passed. I think for the people of Iowa, the best thing that we can do is to create good policy where we compromise and collaborate on, on issues that we can all agree on. But where you're from is solidly Republican area. But is it possible, just politically, that the Republicans have gone too far with some of the legislation that they've tried to pursue this year? Well, I think it's on both sides. I mean, I think you see you see political policy on both sides with Democrats and Republicans. Well, to say going too far. Yeah, I wasn't uh, asking whether it was political purpose behind yeah. it. What I'm asking is, will do you think voters might reject the Republicans because of the policies they're pursuing in the House? Um, well, that remains to be seen. I think many of these people were elected in November to make these decisions and to come back here and say, hey, we want to shrink government. So in two years again, we'll have another election and we'll see if the voters have decided, yes, this is what we wanted, or no, we want something else. So it's a great system we have in democracy. <laughs> where, you know, the society and the people decide. Well, it's better than all the others. So That's right. said by yes. many people. <laughs> Senator Danielson, I, I asked you on the show to talk about gaming. Uh, most people would call it gambling. Mm -hmm. There is an effort to uh, make a significant change in the gaming uh, rules for Iowa this year. What is in the big gaming bill that's being promoted? Yeah, we have a bill before us that addresses three issues. Online poker, uh, a long-standing dispute between the three competing horse industries in Iowa who are subsidized by our gaming facilities, and then the idea of a referendum after a, f a gaming facility has been built. Uh, and so my approach to a gaming bill is to have one debate around issues that we believe we can get a consensus on. Obviously the online poker issue is one that uh, has drawn uh, more attention and, and, uh, and I think as Iowans learn more about it we'll understand why uh, those of us that support it believe that it's something that we should talk about and have a public policy that addresses it. Well, tell me about the online poker. It would, re it would be restricted to Iowans. 
restricted to Iowans only. But it's the, a chance for us to what put money in a pot and then play online. Uh, well, the, the the problem is uh, there are multiple opportunities for Iowans and other Americans to play online poker, both for money and not for money. The problem is. Uh, there's there's no legal framework for them to do it. So from a consumer protection standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, this is where technology has gotten ahead of our public policy. And if you look at what's going on uh, internationally, uh, that money is going offshore. And so we believe that when you provide a safe, secure environment for folks to play poker online, it's different than other forms of gambling. It's a game of skill. It's a profession for a lot of Americans. And you see tremendous interest on TV stations like ESPN and the Versus Channel. We believe that if you can provide a closed loop intranet where Iowans are only playing Iowans, uh, we can show that uh, it can be done in a safe and secure way. Well, let's just talk about the poker, Mr. Senator. What do you think? I think it's. Uh a bad, bad idea. Well, I, I think it's a, a very, very dangerous for society. First of all, there's no state in the nation that's currently doing this, so we'd be the first state in the nation. Uh, that should be a clue for us that maybe we really have to think through this. When you talk about online gaming, you're talking about people doing it at home. And you, you cannot regulate people at home. I mean, my child could do it. Now, granted, you know, they'll put some things in, in place that, you know, 21 year old people could do it, but that doesn't preclude me from allowing my son to do it. You could have, have people that, uh, you know, have, have vices of alcohol or, or drugs that could be playing. And when you go into a casino, those things can be stopped. But at home, they can't be. All right? There's also the, the, the whole social aspect of it. When, when you look at society, many of the policies that we create at the state level deal with whether it be domestic, domestic violence, whether it be credit card abuse, uh, whether it be uh, addictions uh, to alcohol, drugs, and so forth. And here we're throwing out another one saying, hey, you know, let's do this. And my, my curiosity is why would we be doing it? Is it all about the money? Well, here, just to be a devil's advocate, there are hundreds of online poker sites all located off, uh, out of this country for legal reasons. And Iowans easily get involved in those. And then none of the money comes here, and we have no ability to regulate or protect Iowans. Correct. There's 110 of them. I looked, uh, looked uh, I didn't know that I'm checking about 110 of them. That doesn't make it right. I mean, if you look at it that way, should, should we legalize drugs because we could get more money from it? And we could probably regulate it. Should we? Should we uh, say you know people can start drinking at 18 instead of 21 because maybe we can get more money? Write all these down. Say the your proposals. In the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not that. I'm yeah. just saying that you can't justify something just because you're going to say, well, we can regulate it better, or it's going to bring in money. I mean, we have to look at society as a whole and say, what's in the best interest of our people in Iowa? And I think this is a. a a very dangerous uh, cliff, and I hope we, hope we pull ourselves away from it. On, on that point, I don't think that uh, playing poker uh, online is the moral equivalent of some of the examples that Senator Feenster has used, and I don't think most Iowans equate that as a moral equivalent. Uh, it, it has gained acceptance in our society as a game of skill. There are professionals who, who aspire to earn the bracelets and be a part of, of uh, uh, what poker is in America. And so we can either ignore those basic trends or we can try to craft a public policy that captures uh, the beneficial aspects and acknowledging some of the downsides, which is why in the bill we offer the same type of gambling treatment uh, that we do for every other uh, gaming policy. And it's interesting that if all this activity is taking place now, we're not necessarily seeing a spike in those negative statistics, right? We're not necessarily seeing people that come in and declare bankruptcy because they're playing online poker. They're already doing it, so we're not getting a sense that, that's, uh, that those downsides are actually occurring. However, in the policy, like I said, we make sure that we have safeguards for that, which is pretty consistent with Iowa's gaming policy up to this point. What does the bill do with horse racing? In horse racing, it basically codifies the purse payouts for the three different breeds of horses that have raced in Iowa for decades. Uh, it, historically, every year, Prairie Meadows and the Racing and Gaming Commission have had tried to 
go through those contract negotiations. They want some sense of stability in the future about what those purses are going to be, what the expectations are. They've actually come to us with a solution. And Randy can tell you one of the best things legislators like is a solution that we don't have to sort of pick a winner. Mm -hmm. And so they've come to us with that. We believe it's, uh, it's in the best interest of the state uh, and in the best interest of the horse industry. Part and parcel to that is, which I think people have confused, uh, is the referendum. In order for us to codify those purses and those payouts, the referendum, which puts in doubt a facility every eight years, is a part of that agreement so that they have stability as well as a facility. So there, there will be no referendums after the facility is built? After the facility is built, the, the, the way the language reads and the way the final bill will, uh, will come to the floor is that after your initial eight-year referendum vote, you won't have to do any after so that. So there is one vote, but There's after one. that you don't have to. Yeah, and there are safeguards right now beyond a referendum. There's a, there's a petition language that allows for citizens at the county level across a broad host of issues. This is included in that. There's also a safeguard every year if you're a gaming facility in Iowa, you have to come to the Racing and Gaming Board to certify your license. And so there's a way that we can correct bad actors along the way beyond a referendum. So what do you think of those proposals? Well, th just getting quickly back to internet gambling, just looking at some statistical analysis, it states that a, a gambler who internet gambles is three and a half more times to get addicted to gambling than regular gambling. And, and it goes back to being in your own home where that computer sits there 24-7 and you can do it anytime you want. And even if you go to work, you can do it. So it really is, is dangerous. The referendum issue, I also have a lot of concerns with. Years ago, when we put gambling in this state, we put down uh, fr the framework to say this is what has to be done. So all our casinos know exactly what's required of them. This isn't anything new. So to take that away and say, okay, we're gonna free you up more, sort of does some injustice to what was agreed upon years ago. But you don't object to the horse language? Well, the horse language really is more of technical and, and is looking at how to be fair to all the, all the different horse breeds and so forth. How about, how about just quitting? Uh, wouldn't our casino out here at Prairie Meadows, wouldn't we make a lot more money for charity and for publics if we just didn't have horse racing? How about giving us that option? That's not a bad option. And, and dog racing also. And, and well, Sam Dragos and I have had, had many discussions about well, this. Well, dogs, you know, <laughs> you, you can guess who told me to bring up dogs. <laughs> with you. Why aren't we? Why aren't yeah. dogs part of this bill? I think because if you look at the, the gaming bill that includes uh, online poker, horses, and the referendum, there was a consensus around those issues, at least up to this point. Uh, the the other proposal about eliminating the subsidization of dog racing in Iowa, there's two facilities that I'm aware of, uh, has other problems. There's not a broad-based agreement on the way the language is written. There's, there, as I learned along the way as the bill came through the process, which is healthy, uh, that's how we learn as legislators about stuff that we didn't know when we start the conversation. There's actually a dog adoption uh, network in Iowa that's not a part of the solution they want to be. So as I saw the process unfold and in communicating with Randy as the ranking member of that committee, I don't think there's a consensus around the current language, which means when we take a gaming debate, we have to have some certainty that when we take votes that are very serious, people care about this issue in an emotional way, that we set senators up for success rather than failure. And this bill does not look like it's workable. Doug, Doug uh, tracks are closing all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any threat that we'll lose a casino here because they keep dog racing? I haven't heard that argument raised. Uh, if you uh, Actually, if you look at the bill, there's about a $10 million uh, uh, payout phase out yeah. and so they're actually using their other revenues to phase this out so I don't think it would be easy for them to argue that it, all of a sudden they would go out of business if we don't do this. The biggest problem comes in and Senator Danielson and I have worked on this is that we're dealing with multiple, multiple stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I mean you're dealing with breeders, uh, you're, you're dealing with veterinarians that help the horses and the dogs and animal so forth, advocates. animal advocates and so mm -hmm. forth. So when you say we're going to shut down a part of this it doesn't just deal with a casino. It deals with a lot of other stakeholders. So as policy uh, creators, we've got to be very careful and listen to all sides uh, w when they come to the table. Senator Feaster, is anybody going to actually propose a bill that gives the governor his casino tax? 
I, I don't think so. But it was interesting. When I saw this bill, I thought, okay, is this a compromise? I mean, how is this going to work? But, but at the end of the day, I, I just think it's a bad idea to raise, raise taxes. And, and I can only hope that, that this bill uh, here in front of us, the gambling bill, is not a chip that we start negotiating uh, you know, on both sides. Yeah. I mean, that, that would not be proper. In a bipartisan way, Tom, we can lay that to rest. Any proposal that raises the gambling tax will kill every issue related to gaming debate this year. I'm not going to let that happen as floor manager. That is not a bargaining chip. And I don't envy the legislator who thinks they're going to have to file this bill in order to start that conversation. I haven't met a single legislator yet who's in support of that. So this is your chance. Introduce that amendment and kill the whole bill, Senator. Sorry, Tom, I cannot help you with that because uh, I, I'm totally against this, absolutely, but I'll find another means to kill it. I just think the House might do that for me. Well, that's possible. Uh, let's move on to another issue. It's an interesting debate, and uh, gaming issues have always been contentious in Iowa from the first time. I mean, mm -hmm. the governor vetoed uh, gambling twice before he, he voted for it or, or approved it. Um, but let's talk about something a little different. The, the Iowa Development Offices, uh, I did. Um, the governor has a proposal to transfer into a public private policy partnership. It's called IPEP. I'm not sure what it stands for. Is, it, that bill seems to be in a little trouble now. Is that right? Yeah, I think they're working through the process. And I think that they're, they're again, getting the stakeholders together and saying, okay, how does this affect counties and cities, um, other government entities, and so forth? And what does it mean for economic development? And We'll have to see how it all plays out. It's starting in the House, and, and we'll have to see what, at the end of the day, what that bill is going to look like when it comes over to the Senate. Do you experience with IDED, and did you th do you think it's an effective program right now? Uh, I have a lot of experience with IDED. I was a city administrator for seven years. Actually, before that, I was head of sales and wrote some Edson and Siebel grants. Uh, then as a county treasurer, I had to collect some of this money. So uh, I'm, I'm fully aware of all of the different programs that IDED has done in the past. It has helped a lot of our rural Iowa communities. Um, however, in saying that, uh, we always have to remember this is taxpayer money. And, and sometimes it's best that we have a hands-off approach and let the entrepreneurs and, and the business owners uh, create their own uh, job creations. And I say that because maybe we should reduce property tax, commercial property tax and corporate income tax, and maybe that would help more than anything else that, that, that we put together. Keep that in mind, William, about reducing commercial property tax. So uh, what's your thoughts on IDED and IPAP? And the governor said he wants transparent government. Mm. Isn't it going to be hard to have transparency if you have a public-private partnership? Yeah, I have grave concerns about the transparency aspect of the ideas it's proposed. It is illustrative in the Senate that we don't even have a bill that we are able to vote out of committee based on that idea. Uh, Randy is right. The House is going to try to perfect the governor's ideas. I wish him well. If they try to capture most of what he's proposed, it's going to be a very difficult uphill climb in the Senate. Uh, and Randy is right. Uh, what is the best way to focus on jobs and growing our economy? Is it a large bureaucracy that handles very complex deals that sometimes work out? Most of the time you're chasing one or two large projects around the country hoping to get them to come to Iowa. So there is some legitimate criticism about that model to begin with. But I don't think there's any any dispute about that if you're commingling public money, no matter what you call it, public-private partnerships, uh, that needs to be transparent. And I believe taxpayers and Iowans have sort of had it up to here when it comes to their inability to get information about these deals and transactions. So uh, we're going to demand transparency in this process. Well, does that make it still available then? Is if you have transparency in, the pro transparency in the process, how do the private entities get involved? Don't they worry about competitors having information about them? Well, I, I kind of consider that a spurious argument myself. If you're offering yourself up to invest in a community and you expect public money for that, that comes with the project. They need to be able to stand in the public square like Randy and I do and explain why that extra public help makes a difference for them. They actually, in my experience, in projects in my area, that when businesses do that, they gain credibility. They gain credibility for the public effort. And uh, I think that there's just a it's sort of a sea change right now going on among uh, Iowans related to transparency issues around not just this, but a whole host of other things. And so why would we take something that's fairly transparent today? IDED has a very developed process. They have due diligence boards. It's public when they give their awards. Uh, why would we take that and dismantle it and make it less transparent? 
Any thoughts on the transparency issue? No, I think we do have to have some transparency. I mean, we look at the film office and the things that, that happen there, and that's the, you know, the terrible snafu of giving money that was not accounted for and so forth. So there has to be some, some framework that says, all right, this is taxpayer money. How is it going to be spent? Where is it going to go? However, in saying that, you also need the private sector when you want to grow and create job creation because that's the engine. So you, you want to help and participate with that engine to make sure we do have our a, a growth, our economic growth in our state. So it's tough to put together. However, at the end of the day, I think hopefully through transparency and everything else that we can find a, a common ground with both of us. Well, one of the most important things you're going to do this year is redistricting. Now, I know neither of you, one of you has been through redistricting as a legislator before. It's a very interesting process. It's nonpartisan in Iowa. You'll get a map. And you'll either vote for it or against it. Yes. You don't get to change the map around. Mm -hmm. What are you going to look for when you get that map on a Thursday afternoon? You know, first of all, I think it's very important that Iowans know, as Martha Stewart says, that's a good thing that we don't get to draw the lines. There are tremendous problems around the country with other states when legislators try to carve out districts. So we have the best system in the country. Uh, we have a very well-developed process in Iowa. Randy and I are leaders on the committee that will get the first maps out to the senators. We're the ones that have to lead that process. Uh, we will get an up or down vote while we're still in session. And then should either the senator or the House reject it, our staff will then develop another map about 30 days later and then we'll take another vote. And if that happens, you either have to come back or it'll be a long session. Uh, well, I, I predict <laughs> that we will probably go to the second map and maybe even the third map because as I understand it, I've talked to some folks that have been through this process before, this is the first time we actually have a split chamber under our current law. That is, Republicans control the House, Democrats control the Senate. When you give those differences the opportunity to disagree, when you give those two parties the opportunity to disagree on something as important as this, they'll generally take you up on it. So not only will we probably see a special session for the second vote, but we could even go to a third vote later in the summer. And, and what would be the impact on your district? Is, is your district gained folks you think will be smaller geographically or the opposite? Uh, yeah, generally, if you're condensing population, that creates a, a, a smaller geographic district with the same amount of people. So in urban areas, you'll likely see that happen. Uh, in rural areas, you're likely to see their districts grow. And that's a challenge for Iowans. Do you really, are you able to get into all of those communities? There's some senators that have 30 some chambers of commerce and Kiwanis and parades that they have to, to uh, attend every year and then other like me I have three or four of those so it's a challenge uh, I think you'll see some condensing in the urban areas but the reality is even in the urban areas if you look at the north south east west ability to draw these lines you might have a completely different district uh, even though you're in an urban area you could be thrown in with Senator Dotsler could be now, Senator Feaster you is going to grow, isn't it? Geographically, it's going to no, grow? No, no, okay. no. I mean, the only rural district, only county in rural Iowa that has grown, and we grew by about 5%. Sioux County, Sioux County, 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 County absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So you don't think your district might change? Well, it could. Um, again, we have the greatest way of how we do it in, in any state in the nation, right? And, and it's wonderful. However, I could go east-west right now. I, I go north-south. So you never know how this all plays out. And what happens is I could be thrown in with Senator Johnson, or you could be thrown in with Senator Downsler. You never know how it goes. But I think on both sides, whether it be Democrat or Republican, I think we're going to look for what's the most competitive map. What map gives us the best competitive edge, you know, 50-50 edge of winning, whether it be Republican or Democrat seats. So the best map would say that every, every district is split 50-50 Democrat-Republican. Now, I know that. Can't see what would happen, yeah. but 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 I think that would be a map that. How are we going to make Sioux County fifty? That, that that's be a really <laughs> that. That's what Jerry meant. Is that okay? Huh? Yeah. And Randy's right. We are the envy of the rest of the country in terms of having um, uh, the most apolitical redistricting law. Uh, we go around the country and legislators who serve in other states wish they could have it. And Randy's exactly right. For that reason, we have one of the most competitive states. That is, there's uh, many districts where you have a better than average chance, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, to win it. That's good for Iowans because that competition creates a good conversation around ideas and not just party strength. Now, now you're both up this time, right? Yes, I'm up. Yeah. But what if you're thrown into a different number district? 
an odd versus even. You, you still have to run. Yeah, so here's so some people, there'll be more than 25 seats up, perhaps? Mm, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Historically, uh, even though you have incumbents that only have served two years, historically, given the last three maps, 20 senators face each other, and in the House, it's upwards of 40 representatives. Mm -hmm. So there will be a whole sort a big sort going on in terms of the new maps and so Randy and I are asked probably weekly are you running again and we say we don't know yet till we see the maps and we know what those districts look like it would be irresponsible to kind of speculate until we've had a vote and accept those maps for what our future competition will be for the next 10 well, years. Well I've actually seen this will be my fourth of seeing this process just on the outside don't lobby it of course and I don't think anybody would be dumb enough to lobby it but in this fourth time I've seen it I've seen every time some senators go to the house some house mm -hmm. members come over. Mm -hmm. It's just you just get a mix up, and that's that's what's going to happen again this time. You can see some senators yeah. move to the house, or even some house move to the senate. What's interesting is, in, in, especially in western Iowa and even northern Iowa, we could have some districts have eight, ten, twelve counties because the population yeah. in many areas, Emmitsburg area, um, down Atlantic, and stuff like that, they have really shrunk. So now there's going to have to be, you know, something's going to have to happen. Yeah. And we're going down to four congressmen. Will that come into th your thinking as you vote on this? Uh, for me, probably not so much. I mean, you always look at the whole picture. I think as a, as a Republican Party, you want to look at the whole picture. But at the end of the day, again, it goes back to competition, and, and hopefully uh, it all works out for all the congressmen. Are you looking at that? Yeah, and so Randy's from western Iowa, where it's probably less of an impact. In eastern Iowa, you will probably see three competitive districts. And so I've been told by the old timers in the legislature that, uh, that this will be the first time that the congressman is your best friend and not the <laughs> other way around. Uh, but I have also learned that most folks vote their own district. They vote the map uh, as a map that works for the rest of Iowa. And so we'll go through those conversations as well. Well, and for the first time, we could have House and Senate districts in more than one congressional district because we don't have five yes. anymore. We yeah. have four. We could. They tried to prevent yeah. that. Right. I mean, I, what I've heard, they, they try to put the four districts together first. And then they start putting the, the, the Senate districts and the House districts in after that. So, well, it will be very interesting, and I hope you're both with, with us next year to come on Iowa's Agenda. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a good yeah. show. Thank you for being with Iowa's Agenda again this week. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you're with us next week. For Iowa's Agenda, I'm Tom Graves.